Welcome again, everybody, uh, to this uh, first day of the UK Internet Governance Forum. Uh, it's 2 p.m., which, e which means we're starting with our afternoon's activities. Now, in case you've missed this morning's uh, discussions, then uh, shame on you. But if you uh, really are interested, you can uh, probably, uh, in a few days' time, download them and watch them over uh, on the uh, on the uh, uh, the UK uh, IGF website, we'll also have the presentations that will be uh, provided uh, and for you to download. Now, this afternoon is going to be equally as exciting as this morning, and we'll start with a keynote from Henrietta Esterheisen, uh, and then after that, now as as we did this morning, the keynote address is actually uh, uh, going to be recorded, and then is going uh, then Henrietta will be. Uh, speaking immediately after this. She's with us and uh, we'll be able to engage in uh, a two-way discussion. That's what the Internet Governance Forum is all about, um, talking about uh, um, the, uh, uh, the topic. Now, after this, uh, we will have a break, a 30-minute break. So that's at two, uh, sorry, uh, 14, no, 1500. Uh, 1430, sorry. And then we'll have uh, at 1500, so 3 p.m., uh, panel session on digital equality chaired by Ellen Milner from the Good Things Foundation. And that will be uh, going on for an hour and a half until we'll have our daily roundup at the end of the afternoon. But uh, first I need to let you know a little bit about how the, the session works. So as you've noticed, we're all using Zoom. We're not here face to face, um, but uh, it's equally as good and as exciting as we have people joining us from around the world uh, and also on a live stream uh, broadcast as well. Um, if you have uh, questions, and the questions pod will be opened very soon, questions and comments that you would like to make about Henrietta's uh, intervention, uh, then uh, you can type them in the Q&A, and that will be uh, then transmitted over to her, and uh, you can also upvote previously sub submitted questions. If you want to send a question anonymously, you can click the anonymous uh, box and that will uh, send the uh, question anonymously and then if you wish to chat with with attendees you've also got a chat function uh, that is usable this year's com conference comes at an important moment when COVID 19 has had a huge impact on the nation's life and work as well as the internet its utilization and governance taking this into consideration this year's ukigs will hear from many high profile speakers, maybe even more than usual since uh, we've been able to get people who usually don't come to the IGF in person uh, in London. And so it's just one of the, uh, the, the many thematic tracks are, are about shaping uh, society, uh, internet shaping of society, trust, um, and also uh, inclusion, data, the environment, and of course, COVID-19. Now, Henrietta Esterheisen is with us, and uh, she is the, uh, well, she, she currently is the MAC chair, the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group uh, uh, chair for the Internet Governance Forum. She was the executive director of the Association for Progressive Communication, the APC. And in fact, you'd be interested to know that one of the two main organizations that created the APC that came together uh, was based in, uh, in London. So it's got a, a strong London component um, and the APC is an international network of civil society organizations working with information and communications technology for development and social justice. Uh, now, she was with the APC uh, executive director until 2017. Uh, she was a member of the Global Commission on Cyber Governance and the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. And as I said, she's with us um, as the uh, chair of the United Nations uh, Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. And that's the group that effectively puts uh, the uh, program, the IGF program, and, and I'd say, I'd hate to say govern, because I, I don't know if any, there's any governance in that, but it certainly steers, steers the, uh, the IGF uh, on year on year. And without any further ado, I guess we can turn over to uh, Henrietta then. Welcome. Greetings from Johannesburg. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the UK IGF. In fact, I see it as a gesture of inclusion, which is very fitting um, to the topic um, of my talk today. The concept of an inclusive information society and perhaps the first emergence of this buzzword of inclusion in the context of 
internet policy and governance, emerged from the World Summit on the Information Society, and I quote um, the WISA's goal, um, to achieve an information society that is people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented, where everyone can create, access, utilize, and share information and knowledge, enabling individuals, communities, and peoples to achieve their full potential in promoting their sustainable development and improving their quality of life, while also respecting fully and upholding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In fact, looking at this now, um, nearly 20 years later, um, it seems to me that this goal um, feels even more aspirational um, than it did at that time. Um, it's inspiring, um, but I think we also have a sense of how difficult it is to actually achieve that, that level of inclusion. And as the internet grows and development, uh, grows and develops, it actually presents new challenges. And, and inclusion is not a target that is fixed. It's a target that changes as the internet changes and as, as the world changes. The Global IGF is also an outcome of the World Summit on the Information Society. Um, in fact, it's a it's an outcome that um, resulted from the lack of consensus among governments about how to deal with internet governance. They could not agree on oversight of ICANN, for example, on the role of governments in, in processes such as technical governance of the internet. And as a result, the idea of a global forum, an open forum for dialogue on policy and that's participative and inclusive, um, became a solution, um, a compromise solution. The idea of the IGF was first proposed in 2003, in fact, by civil society at the end of the Geneva phase. And then in 2005, when there was this deadlock, um, it became a useful compromise option. And as we say, the rest is history. National IGFs, on the other hand, um, have a very different um, history, a different, uh, emerged in a very different way. And I think that's why they're so significant. They are organic. They, they represent um, the interest at a local level of people and institutions who care about the internet, who want to be part of, of shaping it, of expanding it, of, of people benefiting from it. And in that sense, they, they're much more closely linked to, to, the, to the value that can come from this type of process where you bring diverse actors together um, to share and to learn and to find solutions and, and to collaborate. And the connection between policy and implementation also plays itself out in a much more concrete way at national level than, than it does at global level. And they also allow for relationship building. Another, I think, important outcome, and I'll elaborate on that later, of these processes. And these relationships, relationships are built in, a, in an immediate way by people who already work together or who need to work together. And in that sense, I think the impact of national and regional IGFs um, is often much more visible than that of the global IGF. Although in a bigger scheme of things, they're very connected. The national and regional IGFs are inspired and they gain legitimacy from the global IGF. And the global IGF gains its constituency, its bottom-up drive, the, the people that, that created, that, that organized the sessions, they come very much from, from the national and, and regional level. But to come back to inclusion in policy processes and, and why I think it's worth making the effort to, to break through those buzzwords, to, to understand what it is that we really mean by inclusion and, and what we want to achieve through it. Um, for the IGF, we are midway through our renewed mandate, the global IGF, granted by UN member states in 2015 for a further 10 years. So we are in a, in a very reflective mode. There are also new digital cooperation processes underway, which poses both challenges and opportunities um, for the IGF, and perhaps we can discuss that later. And so inclusion, I think, in a way, um, Inclusion has become what we rely on to grant legitimacy to multi-stakeholder processes. 
um, does this succeed or not? I think, I think that really depends. It depends on each process and, and on those that are uh, um, wanting it to be legitimate or that are applying tests um, of, of whether they are sufficiently legitimate or not. Um, but either way, um, trying to be inclusive and how you try to achieve inclus inclusion definitely can and, and, and will impact on the legitimacy of your process. So it is really worth investing it from that perspective because legitimacy is significant, it is important and challenging to achieve in multi-stakeholder processes. But there's also another very practical dimension to inclusion in policy processes. Um, I think it simply means that, that you can make your process more effective, more sustainable. Policy that is made um, on the basis of, of being informed by diverse perspectives, by diverse views, that includes the voices of those that have to comply with it or those that are affected by it, is more likely to be policy that is sustainable, that makes sense, um, and that achieves its targets. So there's just a very practical cost-effective component. More robust, more reliable, implementable policy is made when the process takes the time to talk and listen to all those affected. But achieving this, this level of inclusion is not easy. Um, in his address to the 2018 IGF held in Paris, the, the UN Secretary General said that internet governance should not just be multi-stakeholder, it should also be multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary. Um, and as the internet expands and its social impact expands, this, this list of, of who we need to bring to the table also expands. And it feels almost as if your, your checklist of, of who needs to be included just grows and grows um, without really uh, often, I think, getting a sense that you are achieving measurable targets uh, in, in your efforts um, to be inclusive in ways that is actually visible and adds value. value. At the Global IGF, we also try to include young people. We're concerned with gender diversity. Geographic diversity is extremely important as well. And ultimately, I think this, this checklist approach has value. It, it's a tool, but I don't think it's enough. I think there are other factors that we need to look at. And, and I think that we need to um, integrate into our mindset uh, in terms of how we design our our multi-stakeholder policy processes, be it a national internet governance forum or a global one, or a very specific policy review or legislative process. And how can we achieve that? I think firstly, uh, the starting point that I feel is very important um, is to remember that the internet and the processes that drive its development and governance are not inclusive. The world is not inclusive. Um, social and economic inequality, inequality is real. Um, the digital divide persists. And in many ways, as technology advances, that divide can actually get even, even greater. So this link between social inequality, which we know we see it all around us, and digital inequality is real. And we need to keep that in mind when we design our processes, pretending that, that there aren't real differences in people's ability to benefit from or shape or use the internet um, will we'll just undermine um, whatever you're trying to achieve with your, with your policy processes. Differences in interest and access to resources in power and influence are important. Um, so, so not taking uh, those into account in a serious and specific way um, just means that you end up with a very tokenistic uh, multi-stakeholder process. Secondly, um, I think that trying to achieve diversity among the people and institutions in the structures that design and run the processes are important. Inclusion that is driven and facilitated by those that are already on the inside is not enough. And, and it's likely to, or not likely to, to be seen as legitimate. So the communities, the individuals that are excluded need to be able to join on their own terms 
and not just as participants uh, in processes. They need to be able to set the agenda, to, to, to shape the conversation, and not just be there at the behest of those that are um, in control, um, usually in control. And perhaps when we have the q and A, I can I can cite some examples. Thirdly, I think um, our multi-stakeholder processes need to create safe spaces for different perspectives to be shared, for dissent and for debate to surface and to be processed. And this is not trivial. It requires careful planning. It requires um, skilled moderation. Um, but it's absolutely essential because I think the real strength of multi-stakeholder processes, when they reveal themselves as powerful and as transformational, is when they allow difference to surface, to be expressed, and, and allow the actors that have those differences to build their understanding of one another. And um, one of the techniques that, that we use in the African School of Internet Governance and that I convene, um, together with, with Research ICT Africa and the African Union, is to use role play, to get a, a, a human rights activist to take on the role of a security policeman or, um, or to, t to have a business uh, um, person take on the role of a journalist um, and so on. Because I think that, that so often our negotiation processes result in deadlock because not only because we have differences of opinion but because we're completely incapable of looking at a problem through the eyes of the other actors involved and this is what multi-stakeholders can do it doesn't mean that people's views should shift or that there are distinct wrongs or rights it just means that better understanding can develop and from that, relationships can be built that in the end will create more enduring and more sustainable um, policy outcomes and, and um, contribute not just in the here and now, but in the longer term, because relationships re-emerge um, as they need to. For example, when new legislation is being developed, then those relationships between different actors who might have very different views and perspectives who worked together or who disagreed or failed to work together a few years ago can now come together again from a point of greater understanding of, of why they, they, they don't agree. And that then becomes a starting point for, for building more common ground. Um, in closing, I would say that, that inclusion is a mindset um, that we should take into all our internet policy and development efforts, whether we are in government, in business, uh, civil society, whether we are involved in technical development of the internet or any other sector. And I think also to do so at national, regional and global levels. Um, it's important to, to keep in as part of that mind, mindset uh, an understanding that inclusion is not it's not easy. It's, it's not necessarily a happy place or doesn't necessarily take you to, to a happy place. Inclusion is not restful. In fact, it can add noise. It can add complexity. But over time, the value of allowing it to your inclusion and the way in which you create inclusion in your processes to surface that noise, to surface the complexity, um, over time, that will add value. It will build relationships, it will build understanding. And, and through that, um, better policy, more robust policy, more sustainable policy, and policy ultimately that I think that, that will change um, and, or, or that can result in the kind of change that we need to have more inclusive information societies can result. Um, Looking forward to your comments and questions. Um, I'm very happy to share stories and anecdotes um, and examples of this um, and um, talking to you um, when we have the Q&A in the next few minutes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, and Henrietta, and uh, welcome to you now. So that was a pre-recorded uh, section for technical reasons, of course, to make sure it all went well, and it does, and you're here as well. Are you still in South Africa? 
I am. Great, great to see you. I think it's a similar, uh, similar time zone as uh, where we are. Now, um, there are quite a few questions for you uh, that have appeared in the Q&A. And if I could just, uh, I think we will go through them as, as uh, we, we go along. And of course, I can encourage everyone to continue on these questions. I did forget to say earlier that you can also tweet uh, on uh, hashtag UKIGF20. Uh, tweet any comments and, and uh, points that you have, feedback that you have. Uh, that's being monitored as well by uh, the UKIGF crew. So um, let's uh, just go through some of the questions there. And in fact, one that I had myself on, on this uh, was, what, what is the impact of the, the new normal on, on the overall IGF space and the global bottom-up multi-stakeholder uh, multi -stakeholder dialogue uh, that, that we've had in, in prior years? Um, Olivia, can you just repeat that? The impact of? The impact of the new normal, the COVID-19. You know, we, we're, we're all being told we're in a brand new world. Is this brand new world multi-stakeholder? Is it bottom-up? Uh, is there any space for multi-stakeholder and bottom-up or are we all going to be top-down? It's certainly um, a multi-stakeholder. It's, it's, it's certainly, I think, um, in some ways, maybe it creates a more level playing field in a localized way. But I think it's also really demonstrated how access to the internet and the, the degree of access that you have um, has direct impact on your, on your place in the world, on your ability to work, on your ability to, to continue your education. You know, it's in, in so many countries, it's uh, having, having the, the, the devices, having the, the access, makes the difference between going to school or not going to school. So I think in a way it's really um, surfaced um, the impact of digital inequality in a way that I hope will inspire policymakers to, to rethink how it, efforts to, to achieve more, more, more digital equality um, are made. I think from the IGF perspective, I think it's been quite good. I think um, it's, it's certainly for, for a working group like the MUG, for everyone to be remote, for everyone to have to struggle with, 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 with similar, um, similar constraints in terms of working remotely, I think has been quite good. And mostly I see people have risen to the challenge, as I imagine you have in the UK IGF as well. And technologically with countries that might not have such great internet access, has that had a, an impact? No, I think that the you know, internet access at the moment in many developing countries is, is uneven um, within countries. It's, we don't just have, have, of course, there's better and cheaper connectivity in the global north in general than there is in the global south. But I think it so much depends on what you can afford, whether you can afford fiber optic um, cable or not. Um, fiber optic connectivity would be available in cities, not in rural areas. So in fact, I, I don't think it's that different. I think the, the, the existing digital inequalities are just playing themselves out in how people are able to, to, to make use of, of this online, increased online activity. And during the pandemic. So how do you suggest that inequalities are raised to make a real difference on a local, national and global approach? Because most individuals feel that they have no way to get their voices heard. Yes, I saw that question and I, I want to thank the person who asked that question. And, um, you know, I think for me, the starting point would be um, to acknowledge that it exists. In my experience, there's a tendency in multi-stakeholder processes to assume that you are open, that, that, that by virtue of being multi-stakeholder, that you are inclusive. And without actually looking at gender dynamics, without looking at disability, for example, in a serious way, um, without thinking about race, you know, it's a bit of, there's this assumption that we are inclusive, we are progressive, we are multi-stakeholder process. So I think the starting point is to be open to the fact that you might not be as, as open to, to inclusivity as you, as you might think that you are. And, and then to be open to, to, to having people um, challenge you. Um, but I think part of that, I'm just, sorry, I'm going forward to read the question um, um, again as well. Most individuals feel that they have no way to get their voices heard. I think that's true, but um, or it's often true. And, and I think that uh, to, to overcome that, you, you need those that are the custodians of the process 
to be more conscious about being inclusive, to reach out and to, to reach out in a way that makes it easier for people that are currently excluded um, um, to participate. And, and you know, that, that can manifest in so many different ways, not using jargon, um, not always using the same platforms to, to uh, invite participation. But it also um, takes action on those that do feel excluded. I think sometimes at the moment, and maybe I'm saying this because I'm getting older, um, there's an assumption that, um, that we need to enable, um, that the responsibility for the inclusion of the excluded lies entirely with those that are on the inside. I think there has to be an element of struggle. So I'm a South African, we use that word struggle a lot. I think if you feel that a process is excluding you, that it's not representing your interest, um, you have to fight, you have to speak out. Sometimes it's not easy, sometimes it is easy, and it's, it's important to make it possible. But I don't think that, that that step of expressing the fact that you feel a process is dominated, for example, let's say by corporate interests or by government interests, um, um, don't let that um, stop you from coming forward and raising your concerns. And in fact, I know there are civil society people in, in the UK IGF who do that again and again and again. And often when, you're, when you come from the margins and, and when your interests and your views are not the mainstream, that is how you get them heard. And, and I do think that we need to acknowledge that our multi-stakeholder processes need that dimension. We need to be open, um, but we also need to be open to being challenged. And, and we need to take responsibility. Well, there's a question that you might have partially answered, which is, could you please give some examples on how a policy choice should consider these real inequalities? Olivia, I'm so sorry. Can you speak up a little bit? I struggle ah. to hear you, yeah. <laughs> okay, That's could you give some examples on how a policy choice should consider those real inequalities? And you, you've already partially answered it. Um, I think it's it's a case of being on the one hand um, looking at inclusion at a general level. So uh, um, be aware if, if it's a public participation process, for example, um, and you are relying on online input into your policy making process. But it's a policy that maybe affects libraries um, and libraries in, in remote and you know small towns, small villages in, in the United Kingdom, then just relying on, on, on an online um, uh, mechanism for, for public participation might not be enough. You might want to actually go and make sure that in those libraries where there are people that still visit them, that still need to use them for, for internet access or to borrow books, um, that you find a mechanism, mechanism of, of talking to people at that level as well. So I think it's really, um, it's breaking down the policy and understanding who that policy is going to affect, who it is intended to, to um, benefit, and then giving them an opportunity to be, to be part of the process. So it's, you know, it's not actually um, um, all that difficult, but it takes time and, and it takes effort. And I think it takes the desire to actually want that input. Um, public participation and policy process, I find in my country, for example, is often very brief. You know, there's a draft legislation that's published for a month. Um, if you miss your deadline, that's it. Um, and in parliamentary processes also can be quite close. So I think it's, it's looking at also the trajectory of the process and ensuring that there are opportunities for participation um, at different stages as well. A question from Mark Carvel. Will roles of national and regional IGF change when IGF plus evolution of the IGF takes place? For example, in helping to steer IGF plus concrete outcomes to private and public decision takers, so implementation, and the question has just left my screen, <laughs> uh, so implementation becomes more inclusive. Um, Mark, I'd like to know what you think about that as well. Um, I think, yes, I think it might, it might not. Um, you know, I think it might also um, depend on, on what happens with, with IGF+. Um, I think that at the moment it's quite difficult for, for national IGFs to take outcomes from a global IGF and, and work with them. It's fantastic, by the way. Um, um, it's very gratifying to see how the UK IGF has used the themes of the global IGF and the design of your program. 
and I hope that that's helpful. I think if it's not helpful, you shouldn't um, uh, take the design of your program um, from the global IGF. Only do it if it makes sense. And I think the same would apply to those outcomes. But hopefully what we can do with the evolution of the IGF and, and, and the IGF plus model is to, to package those IGF outcomes in a way that makes them more user-friendly um, at national level. And I think the other thing that would be good is to get feedback um, from the national level on those outcomes. You know, often once, once language has been, has gone through the kind of, um, um, you know, global internet governance um, jargon machine, um, or, or it's so careful not to be contentious, it can lose meaning. And I think often that also happens with outcomes from the IGF. It's, it's just not concrete enough to, to feel relevant to people at a national level. So I hope so, Mark. I hope we can find ways of, of making that a more usable uh, and a more valuable link. There was actually, a, a, there's a question here which relates to what you're mentioning, uh, Henrietta, and that's how national IGF best link to the global IGF. In the UK organizing committee, we've often had the question of, of whether we should feed into the IGF or feed what's been happening at the IGF into the local community. I think the answer is both. I think that at the moment, um, that can be a hit and miss affair because you have, the IGF agenda is huge and the IGF deals with so many different topics, even if there is a thematic structure. I think this year at the IGF, which starts on 2 November, by the way, from 2 November to, to 17 November, we have um, around 240 individual sessions. But what we are, well, one of the, the future evolutions that we're considering is for the IGF to have a narrower agenda and, and to be more vertical in its orientation. And I think if that happens, it could become um, easier to have that, that multi-directional link um, where a national IGF can say, these are the policy problems that we have at the moment. Let's say we take something, you know, off the top of my head, regulating um, internet social networking platforms um, in a way that doesn't violate human rights. Now, that's a, it's a big question, but it's also a very specific question. And it's one that is being discussed at national level and global level. So if we take that and focus on that particular policy question, in, in, a, in a holistic way, then I think that interaction between the global level and the national level could actually become more concrete and, and more useful. At the moment, I think the link is often indirect, but I think it's still there because you know, if, if, if participants who are involved in processes at a national level do not come to the IGF and do not, um, participate in the global IGF from that perspective of their national experiences, you often end up with a very abstract uh, level of discussion. So I think, I think that, that, that national component and the participation of people involved at national level is what grounds the IGF. How, um, how can organizations that make decisions related to the internet be more inclusive? How can organizations that make decisions related to the internet be, be more, more inclusive? inclusive? It's uh -huh. a question here. <laughs> um, I think that some of them try. I think, um, firstly, there are so many different elements of making decisions around the internet. And I think that becomes, it becomes um, harder to, 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 to get a, you know, to maintain a grasp of that. Um, but take ICANN, for example, which you, Olivier, know much more about than myself. I think they try to be inclusive. Um, and ICANN has developed a very, quite a complex and sophisticated structure to allow for multi-stakeholder decision making. Does that make it more inclusive or does that make it less inclusive? You know, I would say that in some ways it, it actually can make it less inclusive because of the bureaucratic complexity of ICANN. But at another level, it makes it very inclusive because the processes are designed in such a way that there is opportunity for input at, at, at multiple um, levels. Um, so um, I don't think there's a formula in response to the person who asked that question. 
I think it's just something that if you take if you take it seriously, you build it into your, into your design, and 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 you 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 look at who it is that you need to include or that you think should be included, and then you find a way of making sure, um, to the best of your ability, that that you're able to do that. And I think the awkward thing sometimes about that is that it can actually also include disruption. And I think that's also what you have to come to terms with in an inclusive process. It can be more time consuming. You can take one step backward and two step backwards. But I think that is actually the price you often have to pay for, for having uh, more openness and more inclusion. And Rita, we're running out of time, but there were several questions, and I think this is, we just need your tweeted re response in a way. Uh, questions about having local governments and governments being more inclusive to, to recognize the multi-stakeholder process, and also companies also, uh, so the private sector uh, being inclusive in this way through recognized organizations and so on. Do you have anything to comment on that? Well, I think with government, in my experience, the really tough thing is for government to be um, and different government departments and different components of government to be inclusive of one another. I think that is, you know, government is, is not homogenous and it can be really difficult. So I think, um, um, but I start at the bottom up. I think local government is, is really an important place to start. Um, and then different line departments. I think they all have access to different constituencies and that gives them entry and, and the opportunity to reach, to reach different constituencies and include them. Um, for companies, I think, I mean, I don't think there's a, again here, there's a formula. And I think that companies also have, have their, their rationales, they have um, constraints. Um, I think that, um, but I think being open to the impact and I think internet companies in particular need to pay greater attention to the unintended consequences of some of their products and services. And I think that does put a new burden on them, a burden that you don't always find in the public sector, in the private sector, um, to consider um, uh, what those impacts are and how they can be dealt with and to be inclusive in how they analyze that impact and try to find um, redress for, for where there are problems. Henrietta, thank you very much for stopping by and, and for your intervention and uh, for enlightening us with your wisdom of so many years of multi-stakeholder uh, governance involvement. And um, I think unfortunately we have to wrap up because we've got uh, so many other things to do and time flies and we do have to have a break before the next session. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm very happy to respond um, in Twitter um, to further questions. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, everyone.